أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفكه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوا بكرة وأسيلا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our discussion around the 22nd section of the Holy Quran of the 30 sections of the Holy Quran uh, which is an indicator for us that 22 days of this month have passed and if you look back now it seems that the month just began and it's coming to its conclusion and there's roughly a week left eight days left for us to continue in this month it may seem like that the month is passing very quickly but the opportunities of blessings and the opportunities to take advantage of this month have not completed of which before we begin our discussion we'll take a minute here to discuss the importance of tonight the 23rd night of the month of Ramadan Allah himself has dedicated a surah of his holy Quran to the significance of this night of the night of Qadr and he explains that it's better than a thousand months and he explains that in it that every affair every affair is dictated by his Lord and brought down to the earth by the spirits and the angels in this night When we think of the night of Qadr, sometimes we think of it as a matter of some hours. But really it's not a matter of some hours, it's the matter of the significance. That this night's significance, this night's value is not in those few hours, but it is the value of 1,000 months. It's not a simple dictate, that's not a simple matter, it's not something to be taken lightly. So we want to make sure that we value tonight and we affix our affairs tonight and that we beseech Allah with the most sincerity that we can muster. The greatest quality a man possesses is faith. And faith, as all things that exist, has a require for maintenance and has within itself a divine support behind it. That absence of this divine support and without the structure of maintenance, faith is something that is constantly being ebbed away at and taken away from on a daily basis, on a momentary basis. Whether it's through the challenges that we face and the difficulties that we go through that attack our faith, and at other times it's not the challenges, it's simply life and the responsibilities of life and the obligations of a day-to-day -day environment that we forget that there exists outside of the material realm something greater and we lose our focus in these matters. As this faith is something that requires maintenance and constant attention and focus and development to maintain it and to grow it, we need that divine assistance, we need that divine hand behind us to support us. One of the great needs that we have is these nights of Qadr where we re-invoke Allah with our sincerity and He gives us the opportunity in a small period of time to take a great chunk of His support from for ourselves. The only caveat and restriction on this is our own attentivity and our own interest in asking Him and receiving from Him. So the same way that we spend on a day-to-day -day basis the responsibility of protecting this faith and developing this faith, these opportunities like tonight are a chance for us to devote ourselves even more, to focus just a bit more, 
to ask and take that time that while it may seem like a little bit of time to us, on the apparent nature it's one night, but its value is 1,000 months. So don't miss this opportunity tonight. Stay devoted, inshallah, we'll be doing the amal together here or wherever you decide to do them this year. Everything is about the unique experience that we have with Allah. Everything is about that unique devotion that we give to Allah. In years prior, we could count on the community, we could count on our friends and our family to push us and promote us and to help make it easier for us to take advantage of these nights and to sit and spend these nights in ibadat. But this is one of those years, this is one of those opportunities that's going to show what we really possess within ourselves and we see this ourselves and it will be a manifest proof for us on the Day of Judgment that, Oh Allah, look, even when there was no one to help me do these good deeds, I committed myself to your attention, I committed myself to sh focusing on you and spending my time in your love and to focus on you and to ask you when there was no one to push me except myself and you, my Lord. So inshallah, take advantage of these nights. One of the great amal in these nights before you begin your ibadat is again to perform a ghusl, is to give sadaqah in these nights and to give charity in these nights, to spend some time in these nights educating yourself and improving your knowledge, to spend some time in these nights in dhikr and mention of Allah, all of these are great actions that we have the blessing and the opportunity to enjoy tonight and to get closer to Allah and to communicate with Allah and to dedicate ourselves to Him and make sure that our faith that needs maintenance constantly, tonight is one of those nights where you can get ahead of that maintenance by asking for more divine support for your faith. And ask Allah to keep you on the upright path. The same way we ask for dunya and akhirah, ask for iman, ask for faith, Ask for goodness in your heart that inshallah, inshallah, may Allah increase in our tawfiq and attach us to himself. Ilahi ameen, inshallah. Back to our discussion. In the 22nd juz of the Holy Quran, there are a total of five surahs, four surahs that we will be discussing. Surah Ahzab, Surah Saba, Surah Fatir, and Surah Yasin. We'll begin with Surah Ahzab. Surah Ahzab, the 22nd section of the Holy Quran, begins on verse 31 of Surah Ahzab. Surah Ahzab, the 33rd Surah of the Holy Quran, has within it one of the most important verses of the Holy Quran for the Mu'mineen. In the 33rd verse, uh, from verse 31, it begins or continues a conversation about the wives of the Holy Prophet. But in verse 33, in the middle of the conversation of the wives of the Holy Prophet, Allah stops this conversation about the wives and begins إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَحْهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد This is known as Ayat Tathir Ayat Tathir Mararan wa Takraran Repeatedly, repeatedly we've discussed is a very significant verse that every mu'min, every lover of Ahlul Bayt, every lover of Islam should know this verse and should have a relationship with this verse. This verse is a divine proof and authority over us to know where there is a divinely appointed system of leadership in the religion of Islam after the Holy Prophet. And that's a very significant part because that's a fundamental of our faith that we believe that leadership after the Holy Prophet has to be within the hands of a divinely appointed successor. Islam has to be protected by individuals who are flawless and perfect for us to learn our faith from, that we build a connection with Allah and we have yaqeen and certainty that the connection that we build is built by and educated to us by those who make no mistakes. And in this verse, Allah indicates where that instruction is. That there exists people on this earth whom Allah has purified a thorough purification, meaning that they have never approached the proximity of sin and sin is impossible for them to, to, to commit. And that these are the divine leaders and guides who will help us and give us instruction in how to approach the religion of Allah, how to interpret the Quran and understand what it is that Allah demands from us so that we may attain heaven. Now, the discussion around Ayat al is very lengthy, which is why it's important that we point out its significance. 
But inshallah, may Allah give us tawfiq. We can sit and we can talk about ayat al at very, very length. Inshallah, when Allah gives us tawfiq. The verses I wanted to discuss with you from Surah Ahzab are verse number 41 and 42. So the 33rd chapter of the Holy Quran, the 41st verse and the 42nd verse, which are a very important discussion as well too. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu adhkuru allaha dhikran kathira wa sabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. Allah says in the 41st verse, if you have your Quran open with me as well too, all those of you who have faith, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu adhkuru, remember Allah adhkuru allaha dhikran kathira with frequent remembrance. وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَسِيلًا And glorify him morning and evening. Now, this discussion is with people who already have faith. Allah is talking to mu'mineen, someone who already loves Allah, someone who worships Allah, someone who has a relationship with Him, and who has faith in Him. And Allah says to them, all those of you who have faith, remember Allah greatly, frequently, ذِكْرًا kathira, with a lot of remembrance. The discussion around why Allah makes this statement that He's already talking to people who have faith. He says, remember Allah with a frequent remembrance to constantly remember Him. One of the explanations of this is to say that having faith and having a heart that leans towards faith, the heart has a nature like metals to rust over and to forget its nature and to wind up in a state of forgetfulness. And that to protect it, the same way we protect metal by frequent oiling and cleaning and to maintain metal, the same way the heart, to keep it from rusting over and being forgetful of Allah, needs constant attention and focus and cleaning and preparation. And the way that we maintain our heart and the way we maintain our relationship with faith is through the frequent remembrance of Allah. And that the frequent remembrance of Allah will keep our heart attached to faith. The question about what is the frequent remembrance of Allah brings about many discussions. One of them that says that how do we keep the frequent remembrance of Allah? Is it not sufficient, for example, that we pray and that this is just a reference to prayer? No. Prayer is from the wajibat. It's the mandatory items. Allah doesn't need to remind us to keep up His frequent remembrance if He's already given us the hukum of aqim as salat. No. This is on top of that keeping up with prayer is that responsibility to keep attached to Allah through His frequent remembrance. That the remembrance of Allah will protect you from difficulties. The remembrance of Allah will keep you away from hardship. <inaudible> that through the frequent remembrance of Allah will your heart find peace and security and comfort. So this frequent remembrance that Allah is talking about is an instruction for us that, oh, those of you who have faith, to keep yourself from your heart rusting over or that forgetfulness from entering your heart and to be pushed away from Allah, keep honestly remembering Allah and Allah will then protect you from these difficulties. So they ask, Ibn Rasulullah, how do we keep up the frequent remembrance of Allah? In the various tafasir, it mentions that, for example, reciting Tasbihat al-Arba is considered a frequent remembrance of Allah. Subhanallahi walhamdulillahi wa la ilaha illallahu wallahu akbar is one of the ways of frequent remembrance. Reciting la ilaha illallah on a regular basis is something that is a frequent remembrance of Allah. And one of the most beautiful ways of understanding how do we perform dhikrullah, how do we keep the dhikr of Allah as a frequent remembrance for us is the tasbih of Sayyidah Zahra salamullahi alayha. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. That tasbih <clears throat> is the tasbih that we recite after salat and the continuous recitation of that tasbih where we do 33 times Allahu Akbar, uh, 34 times Allahu Akbar, 33 times Alhamdulillah, and 33 times Subhanallah will be something that is one of the perfect manifestations of the frequent remembrance of Allah. So these things, by bringing the mention of Allah to our lips on a regular basis, will protect us from the difficulties of losing faith or forgetting Allah in our affairs. That when we are working, when we are in difficulty, when we are in need, rather than us remembering other things, we'll remember Allah. Now, there are interesting ways. Sometimes we see people who do this, that everything is MashaAllah, everything is SubhanAllah, everything is Alhamdulillah. And we think to ourselves, really, are you serious? You're trying to be that holy, you're trying to show us. We have to understand something. That many times what our intention or what we should be taking a look at is not the fact that this person is trying to show off by doing this. No, 
Rather, this person's desire to mention these things is the remembrance of Allah for himself. It has nothing to do with what society thinks of that person. It's more about what I need. And by chance you're exposed to it. And sometimes Allah exposes you to somebody else who's always MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, so that you learn from that example of how your behavior should be. Our goal individually is to use these adhkar and these mentions of Allah so that we stay attached to Him based upon the prescription that He's given us. Not the fact that we show the world. Think of it this way. What's the first thing you say when you wake up in the morning? Many times it happens that, for example, I wake up in the morning because my kids are crying. I wake up in the morning, I'm late for a meeting. I wake up in the morning, I'm tired, I'm not, I'm not ready to start my day yet. I have to start my day. All of these things, they come into a factor. And sometimes if you pay attention, the first thing that comes out of my mouth in the morning, the first thing I say that starts my day, the first thing that I focus on with the moment I wake up is not Allah, is not His mercy that He's given me that I'm starting my day, is not the blessing that He's given me that my eyes work, my hands and feet work, that I've had the benefit of another day, nor is it the desire that I'm going to make sure that today is a day that I focus on Allah and have a relationship. Sometimes it's the reality that, oh, I can't believe I have to do this now, or oh no, not again, or all these other statements. Look at how we've separated ourselves from Allah. This is a reminder for ourselves that the same way that that moment when I wake up is my first unconscious moment of how my day is going to go. That first thing that I say when I wake up in the morning is what I expect from this day. If it's not Allah and I'm not starting my day with Allah, where am I going? What am I accomplishing? And this is why Allah is reminding us, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, all those of you who have faith, اذكروا الله ذكرا كثيرا وسبحوه بكرة وأسيلا and glorify him morning and evening. The same way I want my morning to start with the mention of Allah, the last thing that I say at night before I go to sleep is the glorification of Allah as well, is the thanks of Allah as well for a good day. Imagine if those are my last words. Same when we look at the start of the day as our first words. What if we look at the end of our day as our last words? And the last opportunity we have to say something in the pleasure of Allah. This verse, we can spend even more time, unfortunately, because of shortage of time, we're going to move on. There are many different points in, in the mention of Allah that are important for us to remember and to focus on so that we can make sure we have a relationship with Allah. The next surah in this section, Surah Saba, takes its name from Sheba, the queen of Sheba, and a discussion that's about her in the middle of this surah, which unfortunately due to shortage of time, we won't have a time to discuss. Instead, what I'd like to take a look at is verses 40 and 41 in this surah. وَيَوْمَ يَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يَقُولُ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ أَهَاؤُلَاءِ إِيَّاكُمْ كَانُوا يَعْبُدُونَ Surah Saba'a, Saba, the 34th surah of the Holy Qur'an, verse number 40 and 41. Begin a conversation that Allah is having on the Day of Judgment, where Allah is saying, on that day he will gather all of them all together. Then he will say to the angels, Are these those people? Was it these people who used to worship you, O angels? Allah is saying that the people are, he's going to ask the angels, did these people that I gathered here used to worship you, angels? And they will reply, Qalu. Subhanaka anta waliyuna min dunihim bal kanu ya'buduna al-jinna akhtharuhum bihim mu'minun. The angels reply when Allah will ask them, Oh angels, these people they used to worship you, the angels reply, they will say, Imak subhanaka, you are glory be to you, O oh Allah. You are are our wali, you are our protector, and you are our authority, not these people. They didn't they didn't worship us, but Kanu Ya'budun al Jin. Rather they used to worship the jinn, and most of them had faith in the jinn. This discussion refers to the idol worshippers and the idol worshippers of what they actually worship. There's a discussion in Majmul Bayan that talks about Amr al-Luha, who was a person from Hijaz, 
who when he traveled from Hijaz in his business traveling in the days before Jahil, in before in the period of Jahiliyyah, that Amarullah was an Arab who traveled from Hijaz, from the area of Mecca, and he went to Syria. And when he went to Syria, he saw some people who were worshipping in front of statues. So he says, what are you worshipping here? And they said, these we've made as physical replications of certain spirits and certain holy angels and beings that we want them to assist us in having rain and having assistance in our affairs. But since we can't see them when we want to, we created these idols so that we, through these idols, we ask those spirits and those you know, powerful beings for assistance. And it said that Amr, Amr, Amr ibn al-Luha liked this concept and took idols from them and brought the system of idolatry to Arabia and to the place of Mecca. The significance of this point is to say is that in an idol worshiper, we, we think of it as someone as simply they're looking at a block of wood and saying, okay, thank you, God. No, that idol worshiper in his mind is looking at this as the representation of a power that exists outside of himself and a power that exists greater than him. And he's using this as a system of invocation. And this is what Allah will say that, oh, those of you who justified your idol worshipery through considering that higher powers are tied to them, are these angels the higher powers that you thought you were calling? And when Allah asks the angels, the angels reply, no, we have nothing to do with this. There's nothing between us and you that they should worship us and we worship you when we ask you for power and assistance. Rather, these people used to worship the jinn and anything that had a power greater than them that they could invoke and call down for assistance. So this is showing one of the important conversations that many times the formal system of idolatry was seeking power from things that had greater authority over them or using these idols as a symbol for something greater so that they would focus their time and attention upon it and then they would seek assistance from these things. In our day and age, while we may be protected or we may consider ourselves safe from the formal system of idolatry, there are things that we count on their power and authority to assist us in our times of need. Whether that's through our cell phones, whether that's through technology, whether that's through the internet. But there are times where we're counting on these objects and these things, not because we worship them, but we worship what they can provide us or what we think is coming to us through them. Always remember the power of Allah is over us and that in Him is our true reliance. That these tools are just tools for us to utilize and not to assume that these tools can change our future or give us goodness or give us harm. Rather, it's just a system that we utilize to be able to get certain benefits and to be able to do certain actions. Not that these have any power over us. Not that these are the things that guide us. Rather, it is only Allah and Allah's power that guides us. This is a really interesting conversation on the Day of Judgment between how, for example, these idolaters uh, will, will turn to the angels or Allah will question the angels. Did you really used to be the ones that they worshipped? And the angels will reply, no, we have no connection to them. Rather, they are misguided by shaitan. Remember, shaitan was a jinn. That shaitan is the one who misguided people to the aspect of idolatry. And while today that idolatry may not be the same as it was back in the day, he still pushes us to have faith in objects instead of having faith in Allah. And our goal is, is that objects are not our end all. They are just a tool to get us closer to Allah. The next verse that we take a look at is in Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir, the 35th Surah of the Holy Quran, takes its name from the originator and it's discussed in the first verse of this holy holy surah that Allah is Fatir Alhamdulillahi Fatirus Samawati Wal Arab that Allah is the one who originates everything. In this surah we take a look at verses twenty eight to thirty. So the thirty fifth surah of the Holy Quran, Surah Fatir verses twenty eight to thirty. This part of the verse, Allah is saying that from amongst the humans, the beast and the cattle, uh, there are div diverse colors and div diverse uh, forms for them. Alwan is colors or hues. The next part of this verse is where it gets interesting. 
innama yakhshallahu min ibadihi al-ulama'u inna Allah azizun ghafur this phrase innama yakhshallahu min ibadihi al-ulama'u is one of the significant phrases in terms of grammatical understanding of the structure of the Quran now remember something in the time of the holy prophet the Quran and the written Arabic did not use dots, did not use fatha, kisra, dhamma, did not use any of these things. It was just the shape of the letter and the people of the language knew by looking at the shape of the letter and the context what was the conversation. This phrase, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ has two different structures of how it's presented. The literal translation of this is that certainly only of those of Allah's servants having knowledge fear Allah. Grammatically speaking, the difference between this statement and a mistake in this statement is the difference of saying ha and hu. You see, innama yakhshallaha is Allah is the maf'ul, Allah is the one who is being feared. But if one was to read it now, billah, it is saying that Allah is the one who fears. Just ha and who. And the difference between these two and the simply difference between ha and who is something that, for example, in the various scripts of the Quran at times has been debated. That some people, now billah, did believe because the traditional position is, is that you put the 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 doer first and then you do and then you place the the person that it's being done to afterwards so they said that Allah is the one who's afraid and Allah only fears the ulama of his ummah of his creation Na'uzubillah. rather the statement is supposed to say that Allah is the one who is truly feared only by those who have knowledge that having knowledge of Allah makes one fearful of Allah and that that's the correct reading of it which is why grammar is important which is why pronunciation is important that when we make mistakes in pronunciation of these terms and these words, we can change the entire meaning. If simply by reading إِنَّمَا يَغْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ In place of that, if we were to make one small change into this, instead of saying that only the, the knowledgeable are fearful of Allah, we would say, نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ That Allah is fearful of the knowledgeable people. So it's very important that we pay attention to, to the Arab, the pronunciation. We make sure that we pronounce these things correctly. Allah continues, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ, يتلون كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَةً يَرْجُونَ تِجَارَةً لَنْ تَبُورَ So, indeed, Allah now explains of the attributes of those who have knowledge and of, of the people who worship Allah sincerely and know Him. Indeed, those who recite the book of Allah, يَتْلُونَ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ and maintain the prayers. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ And they spend out of that which has been given to them سِرًّا وَأَلَانِيَةً Secretly and openly يَرَجُونَ تِجَارَةً لَنْ تَبُورَ They expect a commerce that will never go bankrupt. They make dealings with Allah that will never go uh, bankrupt and they will never be in loss for these actions. These verses talk about the relationship of man with Allah and the success that man can have with Allah. To be successful for a man, he needs to, or for man and woman, he needs to, one, recite the book of Allah, which is a very important responsibility we have. Two, perform the prayers and make sure that his salat is something that he is consistent with. Three, spend out of what Allah has provided him. Sirram wa alaniyatan. When we talk about spend out of what Allah has provided him, it includes, for example, nifaq in the sense of giving away as well too and doing charitable actions. Then Allah specifies sirram wa alaniyatan, that the spending that you do should done, be, both be done secretly and be done publicly. The aspect of doing it secretly is that when no one sees that I'm spending for the sake of Allah, that shows my sincerity to Allah. And we say that this spending that's done in privately that no one knows about except for Allah, is that spending, is that giving away, is that charity that Allah rewards in Akhirah because its affair was such that no one ever knew about it. And therefore it remains between you and Allah and therefore Allah rewards you in a place that is for you in your Akhirah that will be just for you. 
the giving in public Allah is doing as, as is commanding is a way of for example promoting in society goodness and promoting society to the love of Allah and the understanding that Allah is where our focus should be and our giving should be for the sake of Allah this public giving is something that Allah says the reward for this is in dunya that I will give you goodness in dunya and some of your affairs that couldn't be affixed without this will be fixed because of the charity that you gave in dunya yarujuna tijaratan lan tabur that they will expect a commerce so that they will never go bankrupt and they will never be at a loss by performing these actions wa yuwaffiyahum ajurahum wa yaziduhum min fadlihi innahu ghafurur rahim so that he may pay them their reward in full and enhance them out of his grace indeed he is all forgiving all appreciative in these verses there's a very interesting short story to explain the significance of this in majmu al bayan it says that a man once came to our Holy Prophet Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad and said to him, Oh Allah, uh, he said to him, Oh Prophet of Allah, why do I fear death? And the Prophet of Allah says to him, Do you have property? Do you have wealth? And the man says, Yes, I have wealth. Rasulullah says, Then send it ahead of you. Meaning give it away in charity. Send it to Akhirah. Give it away. The man says, I can't. I love it. I like to have my wealth and my property. I can't give it away. Here Rasulullah replies, he says, and this is why. Man's heart is attached to his property. If you send it ahead, then your desire will be to meet your property and your wealth and you will be interested in Akhirah. But if you can't send it ahead, then you want to stay with it. You want to stay with your wealth and you want to stay with what you've earned. And in this way we see that our desires for dunya, we can help control our desires for dunya by focusing on our akhirah and by sending ahead from our wealth, whether we do it privately or publicly. When we send ahead our wealth, when we give away from our wealth and send it to our akhirah, then we'll have a desire for akhirah, we'll have an interest in akhirah, we'll have an interest in being with them. But when, for example, our wealth and our happiness is tied to this world, when it's tied to possessions and personalities in this world, then we have a strong desire to stay attached to these things and stay here with them and not go away from them. Inshallah, inshallah, our goal is always that we prepare for Akhirah and we prepare ourselves for the hereafter and we send ahead our, our properties and our wealth and we focus on Allah and we send enough for the hereafter and stay less attached to this dunya, less attached to the possessions of this world that whenever Allah calls to us, we are ready to go to Him. Unfortunately, due to shortage of time, inshallah, tomorrow we'll continue with the rest of our discussion. And we'll end our discussion here, inshallah. And in tonight, please remember me in your du'as and I'll remember you in mine. And may Allah, inshallah, make us from amongst those who are fortunate and amongst the ones who are happy in Akhirah and protect us from the sadness and the difficulties of Akhirah. Once again, please end this discussion with a recitation of Surah Fatiha and three times Surah Ikhlas. So for all of our marhumin and for those who are in need of du'a. And your loudest of salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.